Hey guys, it's Lane and Blake with Refine Horizons, and in this video, I am going to try to teach you a little bit about version control, and specifically a version control system known as Subversion or SVN. So what I'm going to do, what I'd like to do in this video is just kind of go over some of the concepts of version control. Uh, so this isn't this this isn't necessarily Subversion specific. This this could apply to different. Uh, types of version control, so like uh, Git, which is horribly complicated and hard to use, or CVS, which is kind of the older version of uh, Subversion or SVN. So <clears throat> I'm just going to go over the, the the concepts of how a version control system works. And version control systems uh, come from the programming world, um, and so that that's how I gained experience with them. Uh, I I used them when I when I was um, back in the day when I used to sling a little code. Um, so the reason I wanted to put this video together is is my company um, has a lot of, of hybrid or remote workers and uh, we're currently uh, pushing our online file sharing system to the to the limit to the breaking point sometimes and so we've been trying to think about some ways we can fix that problem and I and I think a version control system might be might be the answer to that so I'm going to do um, at least one more, maybe a couple more videos that actually show you how uh, Subversion uh, can work on a Windows computer with a, with a tool called Tortoise SVN. But before I did that, I wanted to just kind of go over the, the concepts. And there is another video on YouTube. It's an older video that, that is, goes over some of these same concept, concepts. I'll try and link to it. At, uh, but it's it's way longer and goes into way more detail than, than what I think I needed, so that's why I'm doing this video. So, um, in a, in a typical version control system, you have a, a central repository. Okay, this usually lives on a on a web server, um, and that is kind of you can kind of think of that as the master copy of the folder and the files uh, that everybody um, uses. So the the basic way uh, version control works is people keep a local copy of, of what we call the repository on their computer and then as they make changes they check those changes in or they commit them to the central repository and then they check them out they, or, or update okay and I'm gonna I'll give you an example of how this works so in our example here uh, Han Solo and Luke Skywalker of Star Wars have gotten together they are gonna write a short guide to uh, defeating the Death Star <clears throat> and so they're gonna work together on that and so uh, the way this works is um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna just assume that uh, Han and Luke have each checked out an, a copy of the central repository or the central repo and it's just it's empty to start okay and you're gonna see this in the later videos that we that we do okay so Han Solo on his personal computer he writes chapter one of the guide to defeating Death Stars. And Luke, well, while Han is working on chapter one, Luke is working on chapter two. Okay, now, nobody has done anything yet, Han or Luke, in the central repo, other than they checked out an empty repository. Okay, and they've got this, so chapter one is sitting on Han Solo's local copy of the, of the repository, but he hasn't committed any changes yet, and neither has Luke. So these files are just local to their computer. Okay, but at some point, in order for this to be useful, you got to get the files that you're working on on your local computer back into the central repo, right? Han wants to commit chapter one so that Luke can read it and review it and edit it if he needs to and vice versa, okay? So what we're going to do <clears throat> is we're going to have Han, he's going to commit chapter one to the repo. And so we're going to see what this looks like after that's done. All right, so after Han makes his commit, chapter one now lives in the in the central repository. Okay, so what that means is that Luke, if he wants to, can now update his copy and see Han's chapter one, right? And and actually, that's a little that's a little bit inaccurate. Um, let me let me fix something. All right, so this is what it actually looks like. So after Han. Han makes his commit. Chapter one now lives on the central, the central repo, and but it's still on his local computer, and these two versions now are identical. Okay. All right. So 
Now, in our our uh, scenario, Han is going to start working on chapter three, okay, and Luke is going to commit chapter two to the repository, okay. So, um, and, and and hang on one sec. So, so this actually is. This is actually what the two local machines and the central repository look after Han makes his first commit. Okay, I forgot to change that label, sorry. So this is after commit one, the first commit. Now there is an identical copy of the chapter one, Guide to Defeating Death Stars, is, is on Han's computer and it's also on the central repo. So now Han's gonna start chapter three and Luke is gonna commit chapter two and I'll show you what it looks like after that. Okay, so after Luke makes his commit, which would be the second commit, commit number two to the repository, now there's an identical chapter, copy of chapter two, okay, on the central repo. Okay, and you can see Han over here has started working on chapter three. Okay, but the chapter three isn't on the repo yet because Han hasn't committed it, so it's still local, it's still only in his local copy. Okay, now Han sends Chewbacca in the Millennium Falcon to let Luke Skywalker know that he has committed chapter one. Okay, now in reality, the software will tell you that, but let's just, we'll go with our Star Wars example. So Luke says, hey, I want to get a copy of chapter one because depending on what Han put in chapter one, I might want to change what's in chapter two. And so what Luke is going to do is he's going to update his local copy from the central repo. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. Okay, so <clears throat> after Luke does his update, so this is the first update in our example, he upstate his repository, he now gets a copy of the chapter one that, that Han has wrote. So it's now in his local copy of the repo. Now, a couple things to point out here. Luke's chapter one is identical to the chapter one that Han made on the first commit. If Han has gone in and made some additional changes to chapter one, Luke isn't going to see those yet until Han commits them, right? So he, he only gets the copy of chapter one that, that Han has explicitly committed. So what does that mean? What that means is, let's just say, uh, after Han made the first commit, chapter one, he goes in and he makes some edits, but then he changes his mind. He says, you know, I think my first version was okay, and he undoes, undoes those edits. Luke is never gonna know. He'll never know that chapter one changed until Han does a, com a, a commit back to the central repo, okay? And that's actually a pretty useful feature um, in, when you're programming because you can do, you know, you can you can check out a, a copy of the repo and make some changes and then, but you don't have to commit those. So if you're, if you're implementing a feature and it's experimental and you break something, you don't break the central repo for everybody, right? Because those changes are local to your computer. Okay, so Luke has gone ahead and updated. So now he, he has a copy of the chapter one. Okay, that that Han made it now lives in his it lives in his repo. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and have Han commit chapter three, and then and then we'll show you what happens when there's a conflict. Okay, so Han has now uh, committed his chapter three. And you can't see here because I, I needed room for the label. So it's still in his local copy. But chapter 3 is now in the repo. Okay, So that's the third commit, right? Han committed chapter 1. Luke committed chapter 2. Then Han committed chapter 3. Okay, Luke doesn't have chapter 3 yet because he only did one update. He hasn't done a second update to get chapter 3. Now let's just say there's some miscommunication. And Luke starts chapter 3 instead of chapter 4. So Chewbacca doesn't deliver the message properly. Okay, if Luke goes to check in his own version of chapter three, the version control system is going to tell him, hey, there's already a copy of the file that you're trying to check in in the repo. That's a conflict. What do you want to do? And Luke is going to have some choices. He can overwrite Han's changes, right? He can overwrite, excuse me, he can overwrite Han's copy with his changes. He can save an extra copy or he can cancel the commit right so version control does a, a really good job especially with text files text-based files of making sure that conflicts are resolved 
and you don't just blindly overwrite the changes to another person's file uh, w without some without some forethought. Okay, so in the event that Luke and Han miscommunicate and Luke is trying to edit changes to a file that, that Han has already committed, the version control is going to tell him. And so let's just explain how that would happen. So um, Han makes a commit of Chapter 3. Luke does an update. He gets Han's initial copy of Chapter 3, and then he goes in and makes some edits. Okay? So now there's there's three copies of Chapter 3. There's Han's copy, there's the copy in the repo, and there's Luke's copy. Now, before Luke commits his changes to Chapter 3, Han goes in and makes more changes to Chapter 3, and then he does a commit. Okay, so now what, what that means is Luke's copy of Chapter 3, which would actually be down here, is out of date. So when Luke goes to commit his changes, it's going to tell him, Hey, Luke, Han has made some changes to Chapter 3 since you last updated the repository. What do you want to do? Okay, so how do you avoid those kind of conflicts? One of the things you learn when you're doing a version control, when you're using a version control system, is you want to update regularly, right? So you don't want to wait, you know, days and days or weeks and weeks, depending on, on how often the repository is used. You don't want to wait a long time between updates, right? Because the longer you wait between updates um, and, and check-ins or commits, the more problems it creates, right? So you want to you want to work in small logical pieces and you want to commit and update on a frequent basis, okay? But this version control is really good at, at allowing this kind of collaboration uh, between different people, right? So everybody keeps a local copy of the central repository on their computer that they make changes to, and then they commit their changes and update to get other people's changes in their local copy, right? Now, the really cool thing about version control we haven't talked about is version control allows you to go back in time to any version of the repository. So every time you make a commit to the version control, it tracks that version one, version two, version three. Every time you make a new commit, it creates a new version number or a tag, right? And you can go in to the central repo and tell it, I want a copy of this specific version of the repository, right? And so that's super powerful um, and it, it, allow, it can save a lot of time. <laughs> it can save a lot of time if, if a file gets corrupted or you need to undo some changes, right? So that is not something you can do in, in a, a, the regular, for example, Microsoft Windows file system or even um, something like Google, Google Drive or OneDrive or Dropbox. They have some limited ability to do that, but, but usually there's a limit to how far you can go back to restore a copy of a file. Um, and then once you restore a copy of a file, you, you, you lose all the versions after that copy is restored. Uh, with version control, you have, you have way more um, control uh, or, or way more options um, to restore particular versions of the repository, right? And there, there's other things called, we haven't talked about it, but you can, you can do things called branching and merging and freezing branches and all kinds of things like that that we might talk about in another video. Uh, but, it, but it gives you a lot of power, right? So that's, that's part of the reason why I think um, this, might, this might help us here with some of the issues we're having. The, the main benefit, there's a lot of, a lot of benefits, but the main benefit uh, that I think is going to help my team um, from using a version control system is we're going to make we're going to make the process of updating, committing changes and updating changes. We're going to make that explicit. Okay, so with with something like Dropbox or Google Drive or Box or OneDrive, the the software is trying constantly trying to keep your local copy up to date with the changes that everyone else is making. So it's not it, it's not explicit. It's, it, that doesn't happen via an explicit action from the, the user. It's, uh, it, it's supposed to be automated. And what we find is when we've got 15 different employees um, hitting, hitting up, the, hitting up the, the central file server on something like OneDrive, um, it, it just it has a hard time getting has a hard time keeping up with all those changes and things get broken. So we want we want to make those, uh, commits and updates. We want to give the user the ability to, to to determine when that happens and know with confidence 
um, that it has happened. So that's another another nice thing about version control is it will tell you uh, when an update or a commit is successful and, and when it's not. And that feedback is not as obvious uh, with, with a system like OneDrive. So, all right, guys, I appreciate that. I, I hope this was a semi-useful introduction to version control. I need to do some more videos um, in the future that just go over some more concepts like uh, branching and merging and freezing. Um, but what I want to do uh, next is I'm going to do a couple videos that show you like how these concepts actually work with Subversion in a, in a tool called Tortoise SVM.